day comes out of Michigan, and it involves a, a scenario I've been in multiple times, but I've never seen the um, complaint that we're dealing with here. So what I wanted to um, back up and cover here is that it's, it's pretty common when you go into a cannabis project that you're looking for where you can actually legally go into cannabis in a state. Michigan, I must tell you, I didn't read Michigan's cannabis law. I didn't read their zoning law, but I read the complaint and I'm inferring some things here. And it, Michigan passed a statewide law and it allowed local jurisdictions to opt in. And when you opt in, one of the things you have to do is look around your jurisdiction for zones where you might want a cannabis business to be. Pretty common. Okay. It's also pretty common that they start to train down the tracks and realize, holy shit, we need to stop this and rethink some things. So you go into a period of moratorium. And that's what happens here. Uh, this is the city of Monroe. And we have a group that's an LLC that went out um, and took the local zoning announcements they made in Monroe when looking for some ter some property that they thought would be a good location for a dispensary. Okay. They made an application and they went into a moratorium period. During the moratorium period, nothing would happen, which is pretty common. I've had this after a lot of my clients. When the moratorium was lifted, about a month later, um, this company is claiming that the city gave them approval to go forward with their project. Okay. Now, I think that's a, a sticking point right there because these are discretionary permits and there are conditions attached to them. And there was a condition that you had to provide more parking. So this company went out and bought some more property, just put a building down, made parking. And then at some meeting, there was a question about who was the applicant for this dispensary license. And that's when a new group popped up. And I, I can't remember their name. It, it's, um, anyway, let me make sure I, I don't get this wrong here. Um, air quality roots, okay. And what quality roots was, they're supposed to be the tenant that was actually gonna run the dispensary. Here's where things get a little confusing for me. Because in California, the company that's gonna run the dispensary has to apply for the license. And what this company that's suing the, the city is claiming, oh no, we applied for the license. And this is where I get real confused and the complaint doesn't figure this out for me because they bought property with the intent that they were gonna have a tenant who was gonna be a dispensary. And the city said, no, it's the tenant who gets the license. And this started a pissing match here. And apparently um, the time is run and they're not gonna let them renew this application. So they went to federal court and they sued, claiming that this regulatory change violated the state zoning law. I didn't read the zoning law, so I don't know, maybe it did, but I can't tell from the complaint what part of it it violated. The other one that's interesting is they're claiming that there was an inverse condemnation here under the federal Fifth Amendment public taking clause, okay? Now, I haven't really looked at this since law school. I went back and did some research, and it turns out that our United States Supreme Court has allowed regulatory changes to amount to a taking of property, but you can seek compensation through what they call inverse condemnation here. Now, um, it grows out of a California case where um, a property owner was forced by statute to allow union organizers on their property and they sued and the Supreme Court said, that's a property right that you took from that um, landowner because he had the right to preclude people from coming on his property. And when they allowed that as an inverse of condemnation, taking a property for that nonsense, you go, okay, all bets are off the table as to how far this can go. I did some preliminary research and I don't know that I can find an answer here. What these people are claiming is that they had a right to have um, marijuana operation in this property and that the local jurisdiction took that right away from them. Well, I'm confused because everyone I've ever done, um, the state and the local jurisdiction tells you these are discretionary permits, they're good for one year, 
There's no vested property right in this. And if you think there is, pound some sand, okay? Now, I don't know what Michigan's rules specifically say, because in California, you can do a shared use facility where you can have different tenants in, and you have a property right for a cannabis shared use facility. I don't get the feeling that's what we're talking about here. And when I read this complaint, my first thought was, I would go in and ask that uh, a file a demur, because I don't even understand what the hell you're talking about. It's so vague and ambiguous. But for the broader cannabis industry, you should be mindful of what inverse condemnation is. You should understand what local zoning rules are, what local government rules are about changing the rules of the game midstream. Okay? And also understand that if you don't have a vested property right, government can change the rules along the way and you don't have a lot you can say about it. So I'm gonna throw this back at all of you for your, some of your experience and some input about where you think this might be going. This is your Tio Loco back at you, folks. Tio Loco. Yeah, actually, um, Dale, I think it's actually a MSA, a master services agreement that um, allows other businesses to kind of participate under one license that they don't own. I think the major issue with that is I think it's all like I think the issue like downstream is that it's product liability right it's like the person that owns a license has to do the recalls has to do whatever if somebody else is operating under their license under the auspice of their license um and not under the control of their management or whatever then there's always a lot of things that can arise right so but from the perspective of these guys trying to like build a business get the license and then lease the license and the building and try to maximize their investment i mean look if everyone could do that it'd be it'd be a totally different game but obviously the government the state governments wants to stick this on someone's you know back in case something goes wrong they want to burn someone at the stake so if it's not the building owner everyone's pointing the fingers going no it's this guy and you know no the, the tenant is saying no the land the business owner is the the tenant or the landlord and the building owner then it's going to be just a shit show it's going to be a total clusterfuck so um i think that it i've never seen a case where um that was allowed in any municipality in any state um i've seen master services agreement i think that's a common um practice in a lot of in a lot of places but again it's about the product liability and i think those things are handled in those agreements so that's just my take on it mm -hmm. Well, I've done a lot of MSAs, and the um, person who holds a license then it's a management services agreement, but that people who run the MSA have to come in and be registered and, and pass live scans and things like that because they manage and control here in California. I When I read this, Mom, this is the problem I had. I couldn't figure out what they were trying to say. So in our firm, if this was the land in our firm, we would research some of this and we'd go into court and say, I don't know what the hell you're talking about here. You need to clarify what you mean by you have these rights or there was a zoning violation. Mm -hmm. It's totally unclear right now, but the inverse condemnation issue is one that I, I think that um, has been solved in my, in my experience by having these be discretionary one-year permits you don't really get a vested property right in. Oh yeah, definitely not. Definitely not. I I've, I've, I have a friend that's been doing I was doing a project for 4 years or something under his DUP in a municipality and it's just, you know, that's just what it is. They're going to have to keep renewing and um I think the CUPs and I think if a, if a municipality elects to go with the CUP other than any other process um laid out in their ordinance, then, you know, the CUP has a lot of other you know, um, state requirements that are put on them. Like in California, it's CEQA um, compliance and all that stuff. So you have to have all the, you have to do the, uh, the NOEs, the notice of exemptions and, and all those, um, which are just paperwork, you know, it's just annoying shit that you have to do. Right. So, but if, but if the cities don't elect to do a CEP process, then it's just at the discretion of how the city council or whatever sees fit to, to allow these business owners to, you know, get their license, be approved through their building permit process or whatever with the planning department and their um, and their building department. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, Michigan, I, I, I haven't done enough work in Michigan to really speak educated on what's happening there directly, but I can speak to my experience in most other states, and it's, it's pretty common. It's a very ubiquitous process everywhere. So I, I want to hear what Jenny Beth has to say about this because she deals with a lot of licensing and whatnot, and uh, we haven't heard much from her today. What do you think about this, Jenny? 
I mean, honestly, this is another baseless uh, corporate litigation in cannabis, right? So I think when we're talking about management service agreements, those are awesome and can be awesome, but they can also be used to kind of circumvent the requirements to actually obtain a license, right? Like if I know that I'm never going to qualify for this license or mm -hmm. I have a black market brand that I want to bring into the legal market, I want to use your facility, I'm going to drop a management services agreement, right? So I think... The buck doesn't stop there. Different municipalities in different states decide when you sign that license as the licensed owner, you're taking responsibility and onus for all the actions of everyone in that facility, whether you employ them or whatever. It's you might as well have done it with your own hands. So I think, you know, there's a lot of a lot of confusion here. And I, Dale, I totally don't understand what they're even arguing about right now either and what the core complaint is. So I completely agree with you. This is kind of interesting from somebody who has been and is possibly still in a uh, bullshit litigation um, over a management services agreement. So um, I think it'll be interesting to watch this play out and hopefully they kind of throw this out. So we'll say. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Rico, any thoughts? You with us, Rico? Are you near you? I think you may, are muted. Yeah, the, the lawsuit that, uh, that got struck down by the Michigan Supreme Court saying that um, um, they really couldn't sue uh, to a certain extent because it's federally illegal. Does that cast like a, a large shadow on all these other attempts? Well, it certainly could. And this right is now. the complaint, Rico. And, and at this stage, this is what they're claiming happened. We haven't heard what the city or even the state might have to say about that or other parties that come in, or this tenant, what they might have to say. Uh, in federal court, it always concerns me that they could throw up, this is illegal, you can't form contracts that, uh, that violate the law. And so I'd be concerned running to federal court, I'd be in the state court, but I, I just, I, this is a, an ambiguous complaint at best. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure I understand what they're complaining about. Um, but we've all had some experience with governmental entities changing their mind or not giving you that permit. What your options are, what you can do at that point. I mean, the lawyers love you to come see them because we take retainers and we get paid to mentally masturbate about this kind of shit. But, you know, be careful about going out and suing where it's gonna cost you a lot of money unless you really, you know, get a couple of opinions from the lawyers about whether your chances of winning are more than a snowball's chance in hell for you got throwing money before you start throwing a lot of money at these things. Right. 